The title of today's lecture is Membrane Transport Part 4 and we will focus on sodium potassium ATPases and calcium ATPases. The active transport of cations is achieved by a large family of ATP dependent ion pumps known as P type ATPases. Two important P class ion pumps responsible for generating and maintaining ionic gradients across cellular membranes are the sodium potassium ATPases and calcium ATPases. The combined action of sodium potassium ATPases in the plasma membrane and homologous calcium ATPases in the plasma membrane or sarcoplasmic reticulum creates the usual ionic milieu of animal cells, that is, high potassium, low calcium, and low sodium ions in the cytosol, low potassium, high calcium, and high sodium ions in the extracellular fluid. The resultant sodium and potassium gradients are essential for regulation of enzymes required for protein synthesis as energy source for a variety of secondary active transport processes and to conduct electric signals rapidly and efficiently in nerve cells. Muscle relaxation depends on calcium ATPases that pump calcium ions from the cytosol to the sarcoplasmic reticulum. In these two ion pumps, phosphorylation of the alpha, which is a catalytic subunit, and changes in the conformational states are essential for coupling ATP hydrolysis to transport of sodium, potassium, or calcium ions across the membranes. This section aims to throw a light on number one, the mechanism of ion transport by sodium potassium ATPases and calcium ATPases, the importance of the ion pumps in generating and maintaining ion gradients across cellular membranes and how ion gradients affect cell function. And also, number two, to study the significance of the sodium potassium ATPases and calcium ATPases with respect to the physiological function of the cell. Let's study the calcium ATPase. They're also known as the calcium pump. Calcium ions play a crucial role in the metabolism and physiology of eukaryotes. Calcium exists as a gradient across a plasma membrane, with extracellular concentrations being about 10,000 times higher than intracellular ones. Inside the cell, the calcium concentrations can vary between different organelles. The transport of calcium between the cytoplasm and the organelles such as the sarcoplasmic and endoplasmic reticulum acting to control cytosolic calcium concentrations. Signaling events often involve an influx of calcium across the plasma membrane or release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic or endoplasmic reticulum where the increase in the cytosolic calcium can initiate or alter cellular processes. A whole range of cellular processes is regulated by the free cytosolic calcium concentration, ranging from the transcription control and cell survival to neurotransmitter release and muscle function. In order for a cell to use calcium as a signaling molecule, the cell must create calcium gradients across membranes. So to obtain such concentration differences, Calcium ions need to be actively pumped across the membranes against the concentration gradient. Cells use calcium pumps to direct the flow of calcium ions through the plasma membrane or organelle membranes and the resulting gradients are used in a variety of signaling systems mediated by gated ion channels. Calcium pumps are ATPases that transport ions across membranes using energy obtained from the hydrolysis of ATP. The plasma membrane calcium pump and the sarcoplasmic and endoplasmic calcium pumps, also known as CERCA, are integral proteins that cycle between phosphorylated and dephosphorylated conformations in a mechanism similar to that for sodium potassium ATPase. Let's look into 
the structure and mechanism of action of calcium ATPase. Circa is a single 110 kilodalton polypeptide with a transmembrane domain consisting of 10 alpha helices. The transmembrane domain includes sites for binding two calcium ions. Each calcium ion is coordinated to seven oxygen atoms coming from a combination of side chain glutamate, aspartate, threonine, and aspartate residues, backbone carbonyl groups, and water molecules. A large cytoplasmic headpiece constitutes nearly half the molecular weight of the protein and consists of three distinct domains. The three cytoplasmic domain of the circa have distinct functions. One domain, N, binds the ATP nucleotide. Another domain, P, accepts the phosphoryl group on a conserved aspartate residue. And the third, A, serves as an actuator linking changes to the end and B domains to the transmembrane part of the enzyme. And let's look at the mechanism for calcium pumping by circa. First, the catalytic cycle begins with the enzyme in its unphosphorylated state with two calcium ions bound. We will refer to the overall enzyme conformation in this state as E1. With calcium bound, it is E1CA. In this conformation, circa can exchange calcium ions, but only with calcium ions from the cytoplasmic side of the membrane. In the E1 conformation, the enzyme can bind ATP. The N, P, and A domains undergo substantial rearrangement as they close around the bound ATP. But there is no substantial conformational change in the transmembrane domain. The calcium ions are now trapped inside the enzyme. The third step is, the phosphoryl group is then transferred from ATP to aspartate 351. So upon ATP release, the enzyme again changes its overall conformation, including the membrane domain this time. This new conformation is referred to as E2 or E2P in its phosphorylated form. The process of interconverting the E1 and the E2 conformations is sometimes referred to as eversion. In the E2P conformation, the calcium ion binding sites become disrupted and the calcium ions are released to the side of the membrane opposite that at which they entered. Ion transfer now has been achieved. Now, the phosphoryl aspartate residue is hydrolyzed to release inorganic phosphate. With the release of phosphate, the interactions stabilizing the E2 conformations are lost and the enzyme everts back to the E1 conformation. The binding of the two calcium ions from the cytoplasmic side of the membrane completes the cycle. So that was how the calcium ATPase works. Now let's look at how calcium ATPases or circa regulates muscle contraction. In skeletal muscle cells, Calcium ions are concentrated and stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a specialized type of endoplasmic reticulum. Release of stored calcium ions from the SR lumen into the cytosol through ion channels causes muscle contraction. A calcium ATPase located in the SR membrane of skeletal muscle, also known as SR calcium ATPase or circa, pumps calcium ions from the cytosol back into the lumen of the SR, thereby inducing muscle relaxation. The lumen of the SR contains two abundant proteins, calciquestrin and the so-called high affinity calcium binding protein, each of which binds multiple calcium ions at high affinity. By binding much of the calcium ions in the SR lumen, these proteins reduce the concentration of free calcium ions in the SR vesicles. This reduces the calcium ion concentration gradient between the cytosol and the SR lumen and consequently reduces the energy needed to pump calcium ions into the SR from the cytosol. The activity of circa increases as a free calcium ion concentration in the cytosol rises. In skeletal muscle cells, 
The circa works in concert with a similar calcium pump located in the plasma membrane to ensure that the cytosolic concentration of the free calcium ions in resting muscle remains below 0.1 micromoles. Now, let's look at how calmodulin regulates the plasma membrane calcium ATPase. As in muscle cells, small changes in free calcium ion concentration in the cytoplasm trigger a variety of cellular responses. In order for calcium ion to function in intracellular signaling, the concentration of calcium ions free in the cytosol usually must be kept below 0.1 to 0.2 micromoles. The activity of plasma membrane calcium ATPases is regulated by calmodulin, a cytosolic calcium binding protein. A rise in the cytosolic calcium ion concentration induces the binding of calcium ions to calmodulin, which triggers activation of the calcium ATPase. As a result, the export of calcium ions from the cell accelerates, quickly restoring the low concentration of free cytosolic calcium, which is characteristic of a resting cell. So now let's look at the second part of today's lecture, which is the sodium potassium ATPase. An important B-class ion pump present in the plasma membrane of all animal cells is the sodium potassium ATPase, which is also known as the sodium potassium pump. Sodium potassium ATPases maintain the intracellular sodium and potassium ion concentrations in animal cells. In virtually every animal cell type, the concentration of sodium is lower in the cell than in the surrounding medium, and the concentration of potassium inside the cell is higher. This imbalance is maintained by a primary active transport system in the plasma membrane. The enzyme sodium potassium ATPase, discovered by Jens Ku in 1957, couples the breakdown of ATP to the simultaneous movement of both sodium and potassium ions against their electrochemical gradients. For each molecule of ATP converted to ADP and phosphate, the transporter moves two potassium ions inward and three sodium ions outward across the plasma membrane. That's why it is also called an electrogenic pump, since it creates a net separation of charge across the membrane. The active transport of sodium and potassium is of great physiological significance. Indeed, more than a third of the ATP consumed by a resting animal cell is used to pump these ions. The sodium-potassium gradient in animal cells controls cell volume, renders neurons and muscle cells electrically excitable, and drives the active transport of sugars and amino acids. It is also essential for regulation of enzymes required for protein synthesis. Now let's look at the structure and the mechanism of action of sodium potassium ATPase. The sodium potassium ATPase is an integral protein with two subunits, both of which span the membrane. It is an alpha 2, beta 2 tetramer and shares structural homology with the calcium pump. Like the muscle calcium ATPase, it is a P-type ATPase that is, iron pumping by the sodium potassium ATPase involves phosphorylation, dephosphorylation, and conformational changes. The glycosylated beta transmembrane polypeptide is not involved directly in iron pumping. During the catalytic cycle of the sodium potassium ATPase, it moves three sodium ions out of and two potassium ions into the cell per ATP molecule hydrolyzed. The mechanism of action of the sodium potassium ATPase, as outlined in the given illustration, is similar to that of the muscle SR calcium pump, or CIRCA, except that the ions are pumped in both directions across a membrane, with each ion, which is sodium and potassium, moving against its concentration gradient. In its E1 conformation, the sodium potassium ATPase has three high affinity sodium binding sites 
and two low affinity potassium binding sites accessible to the cytosolic surface of the protein. Sodium ions normally will fully occupy these sites. Conversely, the affinity of the cytosolic potassium binding sites is low enough that the potassium ions transported inward through the protein dissociate from E1 into the cytosol despite the high intracellular potassium concentration. Now, during the E1 to E2 transition, the three bound sodium ions become accessible to the exoplasmic phase. And simultaneously, the affinity of the three sodium binding sites drop. The three sodium ions now bound to the low affinity sodium sites dissociate one at a time into the extracellular medium despite the high sodium ion concentration. The transition into the E2 conformation also generates two high affinity potassium sites accessible to the exoplasmic phase. Potassium ions will fully occupy these sites as the sodium ions dissociate. Similarly, during the E2 to E1 transition, the two bound potassium ions are transported inward and released into the cytosol. So that was how the sodium potassium uh, ATPase works. The steroid derivatives, wabane and digitoxygenin, are the active ingredients of digitalis, which is an extract of the leaves of the foxglove plant and are potent and specific inhibitors of the sodium potassium ATPase. Wabane binds preferentially to the form of the enzyme that is open to the extracellular side, locking in two sodium ions and preventing the changes of conformation which is necessary to ion transport. Digitalis inhibits the efflux of sodium ions, raising the intracellular sodium ion concentration enough to activate the sodium calcium antiporter in cardiac muscle. The increased influx of calcium through this antiporter produces elevated cytosolic calcium ions, which strengthens the contractions of the heart, and thus the drug has been used to treat congestive heart failures. Now let's come to the conclusion. The sodium potassium ATPase of the plasma membrane and the calcium ion transporters of the sarcoplasmic and endoplasmic reticulum, the sarcopoms, are examples of B-type ATPases that use the free energy of ATP hydrolysis to drive membrane transport. The amino acid sequences of sarcopoms and the sodium potassium ATPase share 30% identity and 65% sequence similarity and their topology relative to the membrane is also the same. So it seems likely that the sodium potassium ATPase and calcium ATPase share the same basic structure. We hope that you have understood the concept of ion transport by sodium and potassium ATPase and calcium ATPase and the importance of these two pumps in various cellular processes.